Um, I was just asking about the way the council works with developers. Um, uh, for, for example, there's been lots of examples of um, ground plans being announced and then quietly dropped a couple of years later. Um, I mean, I'm quite worried about the region circus development because the, it was heavily criticised by a government body in terms of its architecture and lots of different aspects there. There's also uh, the Lacan, for example, the developers have posted it, a whole document documenting their 10 years of difficulties of working with the council. So there seems to be lots of problems in terms of the way the council works with developers. I'm just wondering how the, the people here would work differently, perhaps, to try and Okay, well, under the new running order then, Andy. Yeah, Chris is desperate to say this. Oh, even, though, even, even though he's butting in doing all our talking. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> we, we've got a situation now where it's the tail wagging the dog. It's the developers that are calling the shots. And you, the Union Square development is a, is a prime example as far as uh, the, the changes that were made to the roundabout, for example. Now, that, that was dictated on anything by the developers. They, they wanted to close down Fleming Way. Uh, this one way, sorry. Yeah. They, they, they wanted to come <coughs> away as part of their development. As far as the effect that has on the traffic inside the York Road area, Newcastle Street, down Manchester Road, directing traffic up into Old Town, that wasn't their concern because all they're concerned about is making their profit from that little bit, that little area. Uh, another example is there, there is the, the, the big development we're going to see out of uh, Union Square development is. Uh, an old people's home, sheltered accommodation, and a car park. And it's going to be an innovative car park, apparently, the little one of those is, but that's what it's going to be. And that's costing 15 million. And that was, that was effectively forced on uh, the council by the developers because otherwise it wasn't worth their while carrying on. Now, the council have basically, in the last 10 years, because they've had so many developments go south with the people they've gone into, into bed with, have effectively, you know, basically gone bust. That they're, they're letting this be dictated to them. And another example is the, the college site. One of the things with the college site, there should have been a penalty clause. If that didn't come down in a certain period of time, there was a penalty clause. But they didn't want to do that and because they didn't want to lose it. So therefore, the developer had the upper hand. So we've got to get to a situation where we have the upper hand and we're telling the developers what we want as a tap and what would make us proud and not be dictated by developers wanting to make as much profit out of a small area of land, not taking into consideration the rest of the area around. Thank you. Thank you. Bill. Um, yeah, I mean, this problem of Durham is, is a tremendously uh, serious one. I mean, over the years, you know, the, these um, developers have uh, uh, approached the council and, and no, no, there's no real public consultation at all. Yeah. I mean, we, all we've seen over the years is more and more these glass and concrete monstrosities and so for redevelopment. We're putting down perhaps sometimes in some cases perfectly reasonable buildings just in order to put some more up. And then, as you say, they might run out of money and the whole thing's total chaos. So, so there's a tremendous problem of um, accountability here and feasibility. Do we need loads more shops? Do we need to keep increasing con you know, shopping and consumption? You know, do we need um, more and more cars coming into the centre of town and so on? So yeah, you're, you're quite right. Um, that the whole planning issue does need to be on a much more uh, open basis and um, so-called consultations at the moment are just a, just a pure it is pure white wash, you know, it's not really effective at all and I think it's a very, very serious problem for a town like Swindon, you know, if we want to have a, a decent town that attracted decent architecture and so on, it's not no way just put it out to, to whatever private developer wants to come in and make as much profit as he can and you know, down the consequences. So, yes, you're quite right to raise this question. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bill. Yes, it, it is a good question. Unfortunately, it's actually governed by actually the economic status of this country. In today's world, it's actually businesses who actually have more say against the people they employ. Um, funny enough, I'm, I'm a shop steward as well for, for Unite. And the reason I became a shop steward is because actually my, my company was actually making people redundant. And they wanted people to speak up, and we actually, fought, actually joined the union and actually tried to make a stand against some of the things that were going on. 
uh, in terms of businesses as well, in today's world, when actually, actually we are head in a recession, maybe in the double dip recession is, is a possibility people, people allude to. So developers do have a bigger say than ever before. And it's true, and, and Swindon, if you ever look in the past, has a, has a terrible thing actually getting the timing wrong. We always seem to actually be pushing and suddenly it all blows. Um, I go back to actually when we talked about Platform 1 development, actually to redevelop the whole parade. We actually had everything ready to go and blow me, the recession came and it all went wrong. And so saying, people recall it was Westfield who originally had to go and develop the town centre. Remember that, Westfield? They had great plans and it all went to part. The recession came in, Westfield said, no, we can't go ahead, we're going to pull out. And blow me up, so <coughs> we've suffered again. So there is a great difficulty with that, and again, we still suffer with that. Um, the example um, uh, talks actually about the Union Square is a good example. It wasn't just actually what the developers wanted, it actually was actually there was, there was government money to actually to fund that. Regional funding was available to go with this scheme. If we didn't, if they didn't go by a certain date, that money would have disappeared. And so the council said, so let's go ahead with the scheme. So they did. Uh, and they also did it without any involvement, actually residential groups or even the councils. We knew nothing of it. You know, we didn't know anything of that. So they actually went, you know, above everything. Actually, we didn't know anything about it. And they actually went with it. And that was a great example, actually, of bad local council government. Um, but developers are having a bigger say than ever before. Um, the thing I alluded to, actually, was also the Locarno. Um, you know, Mackenzie's there talking about, well, he's, he says, well, I'll knock the whole thing down, then, if you're not going to play ball with us. And it's a powerful argument he's using there. But you, you have to make a stand somewhere in the sand. And, and obviously I think you have to try and create something that's actually going to be beneficial for Sweden. So we actually have to make sure that developers actually come to our way of thinking. And obviously the great thing about Swindon is its, it's location. And the biggest thing about Swindon is its location. No two ways about it. It's the railways, the M4, that makes Swindon a success. And that is still a big selling point. And actually you have to try and push that. So we actually give some clout behind some of our meaningful discussions with developers. But I think the question centres around, are developers too strong? Yes, they are against the council. And it has been for some time. We're still going down that way. Um, I recall, I'll give two examples. Yes, can I give two examples? Quick right, one, a very quick, quick one. one. Uh, talking actually about the development of um, the old college site, we were actually told at a, a meeting, we actually then said, well, if you don't actually let us go ahead with this development, we're going to pull out and you can stuck that bleeding college there for life. Uh, that was the argument they used. Great Western Hospital, is, sorry, second day, <coughs> says, right, if you don't allow us to build it a coat, you're not going to have a hospital. That again was actually the, the, the developer's strength there, or the hospital's strength there as well. So two examples actually, but they used muscle, and they got what they wanted to a certain extent. And it's very hard to make a stand again, that's when the economy is failing around you, but obviously we have to try and do something about it, otherwise we'll get the wrong sort of elements for our town. Okay, thanks, Tom. Can I just add um, a piece as somebody involved at a grassroots level, because I had uh, James Digby from the developers of the college on the phone for a long time this afternoon complaining about the way the world mistreats him and he's well intentioned and whatever and I'm sure he is, I don't believe people sit around plotting uh, anything mm -hmm. but what certainly is, is, is evident that we talked about consultation I think he has not grasped the point that you don't just consult the council the planning department and you don't just put things in the advert, you consult the residents in the case of the council, it's uh, the college site is around us, if it's the car notes, Piper's Way, whatever. And I do think there, developers haven't yet got to their head around the changes in local government. Before I